Good morning, or whatever time it is for you. This is Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. And we're recording this on Saturday for broadcast on Sunday at 10 o'clock. And this is the thing that we call Pastor Larson's Bible study, the Sunday morning adult Bible study. We're located at 400 North Swinton Avenue in Delray Beach. We don't know where in the world you are watching this, but you, we are aware that anybody who tunes in to trinitydelray.org can watch this uh, live, uh, or they can see it on Sunday morning at 10, or they can find it on YouTube. It's, it's a wonderful thing. The Bible studies now and worship services are going on throughout the world. We're going to begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, grant to us that open ear, mind, and heart, so that what you say may be understood by us, applied by us, and make our hearts glad that we have a God that communicates. You have revealed yourself to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, and through him we make this prayer to you. Amen. Amen. We're talking about expectations, and we have been for the past several weeks. Today, I want to cover with you the Lord's expectations for Samuel, the prophet. And the expectation is simple. Tell what you have been told. It's revelation. And revelation becomes for us scripture. We are studying 1 Samuel and we have made our way through 1 Samuel chapter 1 and 2, and we are at the end of chapter 3 going into 4 today, where we will read again about the Lord's judgment upon Eli. <clears throat> Last week we covered some of the material that had been revealed through a prophet that came, an uh, unnamed prophet, but now Today, we're going to see how Samuel takes up that office. It's an office, like a prophet is an office, and priest and king, those are offices. The Lord's expectation for Israel under a king, that's a new uh, item on our list if we get to it today, okay? As we begin our study, I want to uh, outline three C's. We are studying what? The Bible. And as we study the Bible, I want us also, also and always to be careful about what we're doing. What are we doing? We're reading words in a book, but this is a different kind of book. Our conviction is that this is the word of God. If we are not remindful of that, if we're not cognizant of that, we can easily drift into uh, subjectivism, which means that we'll put the subject on us rather than God and make it our word instead of God's word. So we have to be cognizant of God revealing himself in a special way, through words that came to about 40 people over a period of about 1,500 years, long ago, in other languages, in other cultures. It's a difficult work, but we have to be cognizant always of what we are doing. And finally, let us also be confident that God does indeed speak to us today in our 2020 year since the birth of Christ, approximately, we're confident that God does still speak to us. Have any comments on being careful, cognizant, and confident? Any of you? Hmm. You've done many Bible studies, haven't you? And I think in all of those Bible studies, you have sought out this idea. Maybe you haven't thought about these three words. I was going to say, we always have to really be careful. We don't read into, read into a Bible verse more than what it really is telling us. That's a, a big 
can, issue that can happen real easy. Very easily. That's the subjectivism that I spoke I think about. also, though, that sometimes we don't know what it's saying. And we, we interpret it the wrong way. Well, that is a danger. And I guess one way to take care of that danger is to close the book and put it away. But that's not what God wants us to do. No. So I've always had this attitude. I'll take what I can. And the part I don't understand, I'll leave to God for now. And right. I, I have to I have to look up things. I don't know everything. Mm. And, and so do you. And if you have a good Bible dictionary and uh, go to the uh, Bible study aids that are on the computer, uh-oh, well, we can get into trouble there because we get mm. somebody else's interpretation that's not correct. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to be careful. But I, I want us to be confident that we can take something from the Bible. And if you had to put a question mark in the margin, all right, maybe the next time you read it, you'll have found an answer to that. I also what are the Lord's expectations? I want you to recall, uh, I like to review where we've been because it's 167 hours since we've done this. Recall what God has done. He has brought Samuel to a barren woman who gave him into God's service. And then he brought Samuel into Eli's care in that service as a protege or as a trainee or one who was tutored uh, using today's expressions. And then the Lord God warned Israel about the consequences of his sin and the sin of his two young men, his children. And then the Lord has revealed his judgment against Eli's house, that is, his lineage. It will stop. It will end. All right, let's get into our study today, and I'm going to use this title slide again, where Samuel becomes a prophet. We got into this last week, and now we're going to go a little bit further than we did last week. The title is Samuel Becomes a Prophet, and here's what's going to happen. And these are God's expectations. God has expectations for what is going to happen. We read it as a story, as something that has already been accomplished. But for Samuel, this is... It's happening right before his eyes and in his ears. Samuel is going to tell the prophecy that he has been given. You remember in a vision, God came to him, appeared to him. Samuel is going to tell the prophecy to Eli. Samuel will be thereby established as a prophet of God. This is a brand new thing for him. Samuel will begin to lead God's people because he is also a judge. And what's going to happen in the coming chapters, but we're not going to study in detail, the Philistines are going to come and capture the ark. The ark will be returned to Israel and they'll put the ark back in its place. Samuel anoints Saul as king Samuel's continue, Samuel continues as a prophet. There's a typo there. So I'm going to ask you the question, what is a prophet? Your answer is, please, what is a prophet? Someone who is used by God to... Um, foretell his message. All right. And an interpreter, maybe, too. He interprets uh, what's going on and applies what God has said to him uh, about what's going on. So that's an interpreter of, the, of his times, yes. Good. Any other thoughts? A prophet. Hmm. A prophet can foretell or forthtell. 
he doesn't always tell the future. He may just tell what has happened or what God has said in his word before. Mm -hmm. So can you name some of the Old Testament prophets? This is pretty easy. Moses. Right. He was the first. Mm -hmm. Who are the other prophets? Once, Isaiah. Once upon a time, you recited them in... in uh, <laughs> oh, you're putting us on the spot here. Well, you don't have to. Uh, Isaiah? Isaiah. Jeremiah. Uh, Ezekiel. Uh, Daniel. Daniel. Now, when you get to the minor, you're going to stump us all. But those are some of the Old Testament prophets. We don't have to name them all this morning. Now, I want you to... This is a little harder, but I think you can put your thinking caps on, your memory, if you have one, and uh, <laughs> name at least one New Testament prophet. Paul. Pardon? Paul. Paul becomes a prophet in a very limited sense. Most of the time, okay. he is not telling the future, but he is a prophet in terms of, I don't know if he's ever actually called a prophet but he does foretell the word of God. Yes, he does all the time. John the Baptist? John the Baptist is the first prophet, the yeah. last of the Old Testament and first of the New. I always say he's got one leg in, in each testament. And then uh, you remember Zechariah? Uh, he um, had a son, and he told at the son's birth uh, what that son was going to be and do for the Lord. Agabus. Did you ever hear of Agabus? No. It's a funny name. Name your child Agabus after one of the New Testament no. prophets. Agabus is in the book of Acts, and he tells that a, a famine is coming. That's a long story. Okay. So a prophet tells, uh, here is a multiple, this is a multiple choice, and more than <laughs> one can be true. So I have four things. A prophet tells what he thinks is true. You like that one? No, no. That, no. That's putting your own judgment into it. A prophet tells what he has read in God's word. Mm. Yeah. Yes. A prophet tells what he has heard from God. Uh, yes. And the prophet tells what he thinks the people want to hear. No. Then he's in trouble. Yeah. Okay, so you've got B and C as your answers. Mm -hmm. I think you're correct. You get 100% on this. You answered all okay. of the questions. No more quizzes today, huh? <laughs> now, I, I want you to look at this phrase, the word of the Lord came. Have you ever read that in the Bible? The word of the Lord came to so-and-so. You think you've read that a few times? Uh, yes. Okay. I stumbled this morning upon a, a resource that's been around for more than 20 years, and I, I've looked at lots of Bible study materials on the internet and used it, some of them. Well, if you look up blueletterbible.org, make sure you put the word letter in there or you'll get another one that you don't want. The Blue Letter Bible is a resource. In a minute, I'm going to try to show you part of it. Uh, in that Blue Letter Bible, I was able to look up the word of the Lord came. Now, you can do that in many other resources. And you'll find that it occurs over a hundred times in the Old Testament, depending on what translation you're using. It's over a hundred times. The word of the Lord came. The word of the Lord came. Now, let me see if I can do that. This is a new thing I'm trying this morning. I'm going to try a new share. And here it is. Up here it says blueletterbible.org. And earlier I put in the word of the Lord came. And I said, please look between Isaiah and Malachi. Did that show on the screen? That... Yeah. Oh, I don't know how to prevent that. I should figure that out. <clears throat> the word of the Lord came to Isaiah. The word of the Lord came to him. 
the 30th year. You see the word of the Lord came and it's all in red so that your eyes can see it. Am I moving that too fast? I'll stop no. for a while. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. Jeremiah no. said, the word of the Lord came to me. Do you see all those? Yes. No. This goes on and on and on. The word of the Lord came. This is a wonderful resource. Uh, if you wanted to look up the Hebrew, you could go here. You have uh, several ways to look up that one verse in Ezekiel 6.1 by hovering over tools. Or you can go to the Bible itself and look in the context of the word. If you go to tools and you go to Hebrew, you can make it pronounce the Hebrew word that you've never heard in your life. <laughs> This is this is an amazing thing. Yeah. Now be careful what you find on the internet because not all prophets are true. No, I'm going to stop that share. I just wanted to show you. Um, I wanted to show you that resource. The word of the Lord came. Now you see, I've lost it again. What makes a prophet careful, cognizant, and confident about that word of the Lord? You remember earlier I said we ought to be careful, cognizant, and confident about the word of the Lord. Here's Evelyn. Let's greet Evelyn. Well, they probably were chosen by the Lord to begin with, um, just like we're all chosen to be as children of God. They, the Lord has chosen who he wants to be as a prophet. And they were very aware of that choice, weren't they? Yes. It sometimes came dramatically to them like in a burning bush or in a vision in the temple in the year that Uzziah died I was in the temple said Isaiah <laughs> and he's the only one that saw the vision like that so he's uh, he's going to be careful because he's handling something that is well you feel like if you touched it it would burn you it was it, it was it's powerful. The word of the Lord is powerful. So what makes a, a prophet cognizant that he is handling the word of the, God, of the Lord? Because God says, here, I'm speaking to you and I want you to tell the people. And because it is the Lord speaking, the prophet is confident. He doesn't hem and haw about it. See? So he speaks the word of the Lord without hesitation. That's important. If you're not sure about it, don't teach it and don't preach it. Or at least tell the people that you're not sure. That's uh, what pastors are doing today, I hope. The one of the things that makes a prophet careful, cognizant, and confident about the word of the Lord is his call. As you said earlier, Judy, they were aware that God had called them. They were aware that they were, in a unique way, filled with God's Spirit. Now, you know that the Holy Spirit did not come fully upon all believers until Pentecost. But during the Old Testament, the people that God had chosen to lead and to speak and to teach and to warn, to comfort, the men he had chosen were filled with God's Spirit. And they had faith in the Lord for their, their own selves. That made them confident. Your confidence and my confidence comes in part from the fact that the Lord has filled us with faith that believes. Well, we doubt at times. But then the Lord says, haven't I called you? Haven't I spoken to you? Haven't I promised you? Yeah. And we answer, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, you, you have. And you see how um, God is confident, uh, confident. We are confident that he will continue to bring that faith to us and to rehearse and to refresh our faith. Well, I'm not going to sing the hymn, but I want to put this in again today because it is the attitude of a prophet who receives the word of the Lord 
with this attitude, speak because I'm listening. And we who study the word of God can pray this hymn today hmm. based on what Samuel said. Speak, O Lord, your servant listens. All right. Any comments or questions so far? I'm going to pause. I think it's just so amazing how God's word way back then still is revelant. Revelant? Is that the word today? I want to use to, for today's world. Yeah. When yeah. Just, just reading those words, um, they apply to today's um, <clears throat> situations that are going on. So, you know, they're beautiful and they, and they give us hope and hope in our faith. Hope is a great word. So we're aware of what's going on. Pastor, I used to have a, a confusion. I don't think I have it now between judges and how they were also sort of prophets or, or they were the rulers before there were kings. And I didn't understand all the differences, but the judges went to prophets. So how does that all mix? You're, you're correct. Uh, about three weeks ago, I had a slide on there, which is was saying what you've just said. They were the bridge between Moses and the kings. A period of Israel's history where they didn't have a king yet. They were going to ask for one. But Moses had ruled, and then after him came, do you remember? Oh, uh, Joshua. Joshua, thank you. And uh, oh, that's good for me. I'm not <laughs> right, you get you get an A today. Uh, Joshua came and and uh, continued the ministry of Moses, but eventually, God appointed the judges, and there were twelve of them. Twelve is a great number. All right, let's go on. The Lord speaks to Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, uh, someone read there, I'm going to rest okay. my voice. Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. <clears throat> On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. Tingle. A shock of amazement and horror so great and stunning that their heads will ache from ear to ear. Same expression is used when predicting the destruction of Jerusalem in Jeremiah 19. Can you, can you try to imagine that, to, to receive a message which is so horrible and so shocking? Yeah. Consider the kingdom of Israel, how it had prospered, and now that it will end, it will suddenly end, and it will end in a terrible way. And almost all of the prophets pointed to the destruction of Jerusalem. But right now we're talking about the destruction of Eli and his house. Wow. And when this happened, what happens is it, it's almost like I'm trying to describe it as a shock that goes between your two ears. It's not a tingle of, 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 of pleasure or joy it's not a fireworks display when everyone goes, ah, this is a, a thing so terrible. That, the way I put it, the, hmm. the, I, I like a shock will go from ear to ear. I don't, I hope none of us ever have that. The Lord speaks to Israel. Some, uh, one of you read uh, this part. Well, okay. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blasphemizing God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. That's a big word of judgment. Yeah. I don't know whether you had a chance to welcome Evelyn. She came in 
and she's uh, not showing because she doesn't have a camera, and she has muted her voice, which is okay, but good morning, Evelyn. Just wanted to let you know we greeted you. The Lord speaks to Samuel in a special way. It's not a very long uh, message. So judgment is coming. The iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. This is permanent. Now, the New Testament speaks to this. We're going to be reading in, in John uh, chapter 3. Everybody knows John 3.16. Mm-hmm. But John 3.17 uh, and 18 continue with the same subject. And that's faith in Jesus. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. Hmm. Now, this applies in a retroactive sense to the house of of Eli. The house of Eli is being condemned because of their... Their works showed Eli's works of not condemning his sons, not correcting them, and his sons. The judgment came because uh, not the acts themselves so much, but the acts showed that there was no confident faith in the Lord God who had revealed himself to them. Some people in the world are going to say, but that's not fair. But that's putting us in judgment of God. God is judging the evil which continues without repentance. I sometimes think I'm a little bit too heavy, but if I'm not too heavy, who is going to speak this definite word? The Gospel of John continues with this word. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The evidence is the works. You shall know them by their fruit. You cannot see into the heart of anyone, like God does, to see whether there's faith there. Now, If you see wicked works and they're never repented of, you might make a pretty good guess that there's no faith inside. But you and I are not judges. Not in the Old Testament sense of the word, of course, but not even in the New Testament. However, when we are put in a position, in an office, that allows us to have the opportunity to make a correction for example, to our own children, or to someone who is a friend and we want to make a general correction, then we become for a moment a judge and we use the word of the Lord, not our own words. I'm probably going into too much detail here. We're talking about Eli's house and I'm applying what the Gospel of John says to them in a retroactive sense. The iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. The sacrifice we're talking about is not the animal sacrifice or the offerings that they made on specific occasions, but we're talking about the sacrifice that Jesus shall make, which does get applied retroactively to all the believers in the Old Testament. Hmm. You know that. I want you to know that. Otherwise, you come across this odd feeling that many Christians have when they're first beginning in their faith to say, well, I know how the New Testament people were saved because they believed in Jesus who had come. But how were the Old Testament people saved? Same way. 
That's a wonderful promise to give if you're talking to a Jewish friend. Yes, it is. There is a Messiah, mm -hmm. and he is Jesus Christ. And start in uh, Isaiah 53. <laughs> start in Psalm 32. Start where God does forgive people for the sake of the sacrifice. And believe and have confidence in the word of the Lord to create faith in Old Testament people through the Old Testament. The sins of some people are conspicuous, going before them to judgment. But the sins of others appear later, says Paul to Timothy. We're talking about judgment here. Hmm. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, said Peter, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? You hear the note of judgment here? Mm. All right. The household of God is corresponding in a, in a certain way to the house of a person you're talking about in the Old Testament. But now the household of God is, is what? What is the household of God? Lord. It's not your household or mine. What is it? He's contrasting that Peter is with those who do not obey the gospel. In other words, who don't believe. The household of God is the six letter word, C H U R C H. Church? Oh, is the church. Okay. Yes. Oh, the church, okay. See, you see the contrast there between it begins with us and the household of God. Not a common phrase in the New Testament. No. Paul uses it a couple of times. Questions or comments? I, that's why I put the blank screens in to remind me to stop. Hmm. And it's, it's 10.42 on my clock. We're going to stop at 11, all right? Yes. Yeah. All right, Samuel hears God's message. It may not have been Samuel's expectation to receive God's word. We don't know. He kept thinking Eli was calling him, did he not? That's right. How has the Lord prepared young Samuel to handle the word of God? This calls for speculation, says one of the attorneys in the courtroom here. <laughs> because we are not told in an explicit sense. But what do we know about Samuel's training in the, I want to say, uh, it's in the tabernacle? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, Hannah set, well, God set Samuel aside when Hannah dedicated him to the temple. Yes. And I feel that um, Eli's household was not uh, following the rules, but somehow God protected this young man to, um, to receive the word and to keep it pure and not to necessarily follow or maybe believe everything he was seeing. I don't know. Yeah, reject what the, the evil that he was seeing. And he maybe was given the gift of discernment at a young age to discern what was good and what was evil. How might Eli, in a, in a good sense, in the proper sense, been training Samuel to be uh, ministering, that's the word that's used, serving in the tabernacle? Remember, these people went up uh, to worship uh, three times a year. He doesn't, he hears the word of the Lord uh, when it is spoken at, at the festivals. And the word of the Lord is interpreted by the Lord's spokesman. So he, he isn't coming to this ignorant of, of God or God's ideas. Go ahead. I was just going to say, he's you know, probably trained in the traditions of how to, to do the sacrifices and to, um, um, you know, 
do that, um, or I don't know if they preached, but to, you know, to carry out um, the temple's duties um, by following what Eli was teaching him yeah. at that time. Okay, certainly he asked questions. Uh, a young child in, a, in an experience like this is gonna ask a lot of questions. And God is preparing him through these exposures to what God's will is for God's people. So when Samuel said, speak for your servant hears, the Lord spoke right into his ears. Didn't mean for it to rhyme, but it does. He has a vision. The Lord comes to him in a vision. So what attitude and faith does this demonstrate when Samuel says, speak for your servant is listening? Submission. Pardon? Submission. I mean, he was going. Right. Um, he, yes, he's, re he's ready to hear the word. Um, not to, not to avoid it or not to right. really dig into the meaning of the word, I guess. You know, you, you, you can read something and just read it, not get anything out of it. And then, of course, you can read it um, after praying about a Bible verse and suddenly the true meaning comes to you. So I think when you're ready, well, when we're humanly ready sometimes to listen, we acknowledge it and let the Lord, we, we let the Lord know. He knows that we're ready finally. All right. You're speaking about your personal faith in, in God mm -hmm. being able, willing, and acting to speak to you in his word. So he's, he's open. His ears are open. All right. Meanwhile, do you think Eli has gone back to sleep? Calls for speculation. Mm. He told Samuel to go lay and to go lay down, go back, and and listen. But he does not yet know what God is going to say to Samuel. But in the morning, Samuel is afraid to tell the message. Someone read this, please. Samuel lay, Samuel lay until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. Yeah, rather nervously. <laughs> <laughs> so we might imagine Samuel not being able to sleep after that vision. Remember, this is the first time he has had this experience. And it comes to him like a whoop. <laughs> the judgment is coming against him. And after he has observed what has been going on, he understands why that judgment is coming. And this lays heavy upon his heart, this message. Now, he's not a stenographer. He does not, as far as we can tell anyway, write this down, the message. I am told that the people of the Bible in the age of the Bible had better memories than the people in our, in the last many centuries, because ever since the book was invented and the book was printed, we have access to words so that we say, I don't have to remember it. I can always go back and read it. Mm -hmm. But in uh, the Middle East, I am told that there are people who have memorized whole books of the New Testament that people can recite. I have seen on YouTube someone reciting the entire Gospel of Mark without notes, just reading it off. Can you imagine anyone doing that? Look it up. You'll, you'll be amazed that anybody could do that. I can recite a little bit of four score and seven years ago, 
I can recite a little bit of We the People because I had to memorize that in 10th grade. Maybe you did too. But I was not told to memorize a lot of the Bible in big chunks. Anyway, I'm getting off the subject. It's one of my tangents. I'm trying to be better about that. We might imagine Samuel carrying this message carefully, not being able to sleep. So here's a question for you. What is the significance, if any, of Eli calling Samuel my son? Hmm. I don't know about adoption papers. I hadn't seen any. <laughs> I'm anticipating you were going to say that. Well, he raised him from the time he was an infant, so he really was a surrogate father to him. Yes, at least. And spent lots of time with him. Mm -hmm. Now, I suppose there is amongst the clergy in some denominations the likelihood that a pastor would say to a young lad, come here, my son, when there's no relationship other than a member of the congregation, mm -hmm. a son of one of the members. Come here, my son. Well, he, he lived in Eli's house. Um, yes, he did. So. And ate meals with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, prayed with him, perhaps, if Eli was still praying. I don't know. I don't well, have any evidence. I, well, go ahead, Doug. Oh, uh, Chris, Christine, uh, he was, by saying that, would he have been lumped into the sons of Eli? Was that a problem? No, no. Never. Okay. Not a Bible word about that. Yeah. He's an obedient uh, adopted son. I'll use the word adopted in the general sense. Mm -hmm. So here's another question for you. Why was Samuel afraid to tell what the Lord said would happen? It wasn't too good a news for him, for the most part, to Eli or to his family. He must have loved Eli by this point. You know, that was his only um, yes. authority figure, sort of. There's a relationship there. Mm. You give me a, a word of judgment to say to someone who is close to me, whom I love and care for and care about, and now the Lord tells me, that's going to be destroyed. Yeah. And the implications of that for the priesthood, something we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the priesthood is not going to die, but God will reestablish the priesthood later on. But right now, it's just going to collapse. You, you realize the wide significance of that. Well, it also would put Samuel next in line to oversee the temple. Um, and you almost, I don't want to, maybe I'm, here I'm starting to read into the words, but um, that he was, you know, being afraid that he'd be um, judgmental about the fact that he was uh, going to be able, that he was going to take over the temple. That isn't the word I want. Yeah, I know. Uh, but I read First uh, Samuel 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8, and not a word comes up about Samuel serving as a priest in the temple. Oh, okay. But so, he wasn't of the line. He couldn't. He, he wasn't of the line of, um, oops, uh, word dropped out, Aaron. He wasn't from Aaron's line. But he did some priestly activities. And the one I keep coming up with is the obvious one when he anoints Saul and later David. Yeah, I was going to say it was, you know, he, I would, I would think you didn't want to think it was like a takeover. No, that no way. Type of situation. Um, but he's afraid to tell Eli because of the magnitude of the message. That's mm -hmm. what uh, yeah. is going on here. So Eli demands to hear the message. And this is as far as we're going to get today. Remember that Eli knew that the Lord was speaking to Samuel because Eli, and the quote we have from verse 8 is, Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. How, how Eli perceived that? Well, three times in the middle of the night, you called me. 
No, it wasn't. I was not calling you. Go back and lay down. Go back and lay down. The third time, Eli said, it's the Lord that's calling the boy. Can you imagine the amazement on the part of Eli? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. There's something special happening here. It's interesting that it was three times also. Yes. Many things in the Bible happen three times. Yes, yes they have the numerical. Yeah. So, uh, Chris, would you read 1 Samuel 3, 18 and 19? Okay. And Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. And he it goes said, on in verse yeah. 18. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. What do you think of this warning? May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything. Wow. Huh? He, he didn't have any power for that anyway. He's going to tell it. Yeah. Eli demands to hear. So Samuel told him, and this is what the Lord had told Samuel concerning Eli. I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Short but not sweet. It's judgment. And Eli's reaction, this is really interesting. What did Eli say? Oh. And he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Who can receive the judgment of God in such a dramatic, overwhelming sense and say, well, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. I don't read Eli's heart. You may want to, but I, I caution you. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, what, the word you brought up earlier, the phrase you brought up, Judy, read into, has a special word in Bible studies, and it's called eisegesis. E-I-S. Eisegesis. Okay. And it comes from a, a, a Greek word, and the eis means into. Okay? If I were on the whiteboard, I'd write this up there if we were upstairs. Now, there's another word that we use, and it's a good word. It's called exegesis. It has the same ending. Eisegesis, exegesis. No, it's not J-E-S-U-S. -S. It's G-E. Okay? Eisegesis is read into. Ex is the Greek prefix for out of. To do Exegesis is to read out of the word of God. You get the distinction? Maybe I'll put a slide up next week. I said Jesus into, don't do that. Let the Lord do what seems good to him. So how would you describe Eli's reaction to the Lord's judgment? Accepting. Yeah, accepting. That's amazing. Resignation? No. Okay, let it happen. Mm -hmm. Wow. I think he knew he was wrong. Yes, I think so. And what else could Eli do at this point? Yeah. But accept. How are you going to fight the word of the Lord when it comes in judgment against it's, you? It's almost kind of a, a repentance type of statement. Almost. There's that word again, almost. Well, here, here's what I'm going to put to you, Judy, and to all of us. There is a thing called remorse, which mm -hmm. Judas had, but not repentance and faith. Remorse is, I'm sorry I got caught, not right. I'm sorry I did it. 
Yeah, it's 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 no it's knowing that you weren't um, raising your sons the way the Lord wanted them to be raised. Yeah. What else could Eli do? You and I never want to hear the Lord speak against us in that way. So we will what? Repent. We will repent and believe that the Lord has taken care of us. Mm. So God is going to establish Samuel as his prophet. And what you're going to read, and I hope you will, is read the end of chapter 3, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the end of the chapter, do not even take a breath, but rush right on to the first verse in chapter 4. Yeah. Yeah, you, you look at it. Okay. So we're going to end there with a prayer. And I'm so glad that you joined us this morning, whether you're online or uh, whether you are here in person. The Lord be with you until we meet again. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray a blessing upon the word that has been taught and believed and taken into hearts. God grant this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.